On this stretch of land in North America, 250 years ago, a British army, outnumbered and in the heart of enemy territory, fought a battle that would change the history of the world. It was the 13th of September, 1759, and it was the Battle of Quebec. Now largely forgotten, this battle was once a story every schoolchild would have known, a founding myth of the British Empire. Britain used its industrial strength and a scientific approach to fight a campaign unlike any that had gone before. It sent a fleet of nearly 200 ships, carrying 20,000 men on a treacherous mission through uncharted waters. This campaign would become a template for how Britain would go on to conquer vast areas of the world. And it led to the creation of modern America as we know it today. I've always been fascinated by the events of 1759. This was the moment when two great superpowers, Britain and France, fought an extraordinary campaign over the future of the American continent. At the center of the conflict was the French city of Quebec in Canada. I'm half Canadian, and during my summer holidays in Canada, I used to hear stories of that battle, of the daring exploits on the water and on the battlefield. I spent the last three years writing a book on the conflict and what I've realized is just how important and dramatic those events really were. 1759 really was such a significant year. It was a time when new British technology and industry combined with her financial might to create a new kind of warfare. This new way of fighting would enable Britain to amass the largest empire in the history of the world, with London at its very center. It was a turning point in history, not just for Britain, but for the entire world. But nowhere are the effects of that year more visible than in today's United States of America. Nowadays, we take it for granted that Americans speak English and not French. The special relationship may come and go, but the English influence is still strong in language, culture, and the law. But it could have been very different. I'm in downtown Pittsburgh, and this is the spot where this city really began. There's an outline here of an 18th century fort, but it wasn't British, this was French. It was called Fort Duquesne. It was just one of many French forts that extended through a vast North American empire, from the Gulf of Mexico, thousands of miles that way, up to the Atlantic Ocean. I've got a contemporary map here which shows simply the scale of this empire. This was New France, which stretched right from the far south all the way up to the Great Lakes and beyond. It surrounded the British territory, which was restricted to a strip of land along the east coast. The rapidly expanding population of the British colonies in North America was desperate to expand west into the heart of the continent. But that, of course, was territory already claimed by the French. Conflict between New France and British America was inevitable. For some years, a state of Cold War had existed between the two powers. The wild area along the frontiers had become a no-man's land, patrolled by both British and French soldiers. But that uneasy peace was shattered by an event that occurred not far from Pittsburgh in a wood now called Jumanville Glen. At dawn on a day in late May 1754, a French force of around 30 men were suddenly attacked by British troops that had taken positions on the high ground there and in the woods surrounding them. 
10 of the French troops were killed immediately and the other 20 were taken captive. This was an unprovoked attack. The two sides were not technically at war. The young man in command of the attacking force was a 22-year-old British officer who'd been born in the American colonies. His name was George Washington. Washington's action enraged the French and was the spark that would ignite the world's first truly global conflict. This was the Seven Years' War, a clash of superpowers over vast areas of the planet. France and Britain each had empires stretching across the world. They and their allies would end up fighting each other, not just in Europe, but also in Africa, India and the Far East, wherever the two sides had colonies. But some of the fiercest fighting was in the resource-rich Americas. The capital of the French Americas was Quebec. And from here, the French inflicted defeat after defeat on the British, most famously at Fort William Henry, the battle featured in Last of the Mohicans. But Britain did manage one success, albeit in the remote eastern extremity of the continent, today's Nova Scotia. This is Louisbourg, which is a powerful French fortress clinging to the eastern edge of North America. That's the Atlantic just there, and this is built on a rocky outcrop of barren land, always assaulted by wind and rain and banks of fog. But it was a very strategic point because it controlled access up there into New France. Louisbourg sits at the mouth of the St. Lawrence River, a huge waterway that reaches deep into the continent and right through French territory. The British knew of its importance, and in 1758, they took it from the French in a six-week siege. It had been the Navy that had been decisive in the capture of Louisbourg. They had brought the British troops here and landed them and their supplies so that they could begin the siege. But they'd also blockaded the harbour to stop any supplies or help reaching Louisbourg from France. And they'd also sailed up close to these walls and pounded them to dust with their massive broadsides of cannon. So, British planners and politicians thought that if the Navy had been so successful in 1758 in delivering Britain a great victory, perhaps they could do so again in 1759, this time by launching a bold operation aimed right at the heart of New France. The plan was to attack the capital of New France, the city of Quebec. This beautiful city, already 150 years old, was the spiritual and military centre of the French Americas. But Quebec is deep in the heart of French territory, protected by hundreds of miles of wilderness. Just getting to it seemed like an impossible task. So the British developed a plan based on its navy, an army of over 10,000 soldiers would board ships at Louisbourg. Then they'd sail up into the dangerous St. Lawrence River, through enemy territory, right to the walls of Quebec. Such a plan would be difficult, dangerous, and very expensive. To command the British Army on this expedition, the government made a surprising choice. They appointed a young man who'd shown his zeal and flair the year before during the fighting here at Louisbourg. His name was James Wolfe. He was 32 years old and he'd never commanded an army before. He certainly didn't look like a hero. I've got a portrait of him here. He was very tall, gangly, apparently very chinless as well. But he didn't lack physical courage. He was always in the thick of the fighting. He did, however, have a very weak constitution. His diary is full of complaints about his ill health, and sea travel made him violently ill. He was, perhaps, a surprising choice for what would be a gruelling expedition hundreds and hundreds of miles away from the nearest friendly base. Wolfe was part of a new breed of highly professional British officer who emphasised careful preparation in every detail of combat. And nothing was more important than the health of his men. One of the biggest threats to his force was scurvy, but luckily, against that, 
he had a secret weapon. There may not be much fresh fruit in Nova Scotia, but there is plenty of spruce pine. Pinewood contains vitamin C, which keeps scurvy away. And the British had discovered a way of making it into beer. To find out what spruce beer tastes like, I've come to visit a local home brew enthusiast who's made a batch based on an authentic 18th century recipe. Well, what it said in uh, the recipe was a pound and a half of uh, good spruce, it says. So I cut it up small enough to go in this pot and then we have to boil it until the bark peels off. That's a nice smell. I love the old spruce smell. You can't beat it. Okay, so this is spruce beer that you've already brewed. Right, time to taste it? It's time. Cheers. Cheers. I'm nervous. I can certainly taste the spruce. Yeah, but <laughs> it's pretty disgusting. Though. That's pretty gross. You'd have to be very sick to drink this stuff. Oh my God. I don't know how to describe it. It's just totally disgusting. That is one awful beer. <laughs> At Louisbourg, this beer would have been produced on an industrial scale, all part of the meticulous scientific approach to warfare that the British were pioneering. But Wolfe faced a danger even greater than scurvy, time. He had just a few months to get to Quebec and defeat the French before the bitter winter arrived and the St. Lawrence turned to impenetrable ice. At the beginning of June 1759, Wolfe decides to leave and the British Admiral flies his flag at the main topmast and slowly over a hundred ships began to try and sail out of the harbour. The weather was pretty fair when they set off, but of course before all these ships could leave the harbour it actually changed. Some, some cloud came in like today in the rain, which meant lots of the ships had to re-anchor, wait for the wet wind to change, and that would have taken a few days. So everything was going at a glacial pace and Wolf was getting increasingly impatient. Over a few days, this harbour would slowly have emptied of all its ships as they headed towards Quebec. Wolf was so keen to get underway that he'd left before the entire force was assembled, and he'd actually left instructions here telling any stragglers to meet him at Quebec. Within days, the fleet had entered the mighty St. Lawrence. You can see just what a huge stretch of water this is, one of the great rivers of the world. This was such an extraordinary logistical achievement, really one that was unmatched at that point in British history. Nearly 200 ships had been assembled throughout the British Isles and also the British colonies in North America, and in them was every bag of flour, every nail, every cannonball that the expedition would need. They carried 163 pieces of siege artillery, uh, cattle, spades, 1.2 million musket cartridges, and uh, what, nearly 11,000 big barrels of gunpowder. It is like picking up a city and moving it 1,000 miles. Before Wolf faced the enemy, he would have to make a long and treacherous journey. The St. Lawrence River is one of the most difficult stretches of water in the world. Even experienced French sailors struggled to bring ships up the river, and there were no charts to guide them. I'm ready. Ready about? Yep, ready. Okay. Here we go. To find out just how challenging this river is, I went out with a local sailor who knows the area well. <sighs> Around here, we're in the middle channel right on the St. Lawrence, and it's, it's got a terrible reputation. It's, surround, it's just lined with rocks and reefs and everything else. 
I can see, yeah, you can just see these little ridges of rock here. They're just going to rip the bottom out of your boat wow. if you get it wrong, eh? Yeah, exactly. And we're in 52 feet of water right now, but uh, shortly we'll be in zero feet of water. <laughs> we'll try to be careful. Well, it's, it's not an easy river to sail on this, is it? It's not an easy river. You have cu The current changes direction every six hours. So sure. I guess that's the tide kind of crashing in and crashing out every six hours. It's a huge body of water just moving up and down, I guess, eh? This is one of the biggest or largest rivers in the world. So you've spent your entire life sailing here, and it still, it still sounds like it's challenging enough. I mean, those, those Brits came up here in 1759. Not one of them had ever sailed up this uh, river before. Well, they must have been half crazy. <laughs> Wolf was undeterred. He had some of the world's best sailors to guide him. Amongst them, a young James Cook, who would go on to become the famous explorer of the Pacific, Captain Cook. OK. Cook set out to systematically map the river, using a simple but effective piece of technology to measure the depth, a sounding line. Seven fathoms, 42 feet deep. There you go. In this hole, they'd put wax, yeah. so they could tell if there was sand or mud or rock or whatever, yeah. and uh, that's how they knew uh, where they could put the hook down. So it's a pretty primitive bit of technology, but it tells you the depth and it tells you sure. what the seabed is like. Exactly. So Not you too get, bad. You get uh, two for one. <laughs> when men like James Cook had done enough of those soundings, they were able to put them together and compile an accurate picture of what they thought the navigation of the St. Lawrence looked like. And this is James Cook's chart of the St. Lawrence, which incredibly is the first time anyone had attempted to chart this river, French or British. It is still scarily accurate, and you can see just how tricky the navigation is, how important to get right. And this is so much more than the chart. This is a vital piece of evidence. If you're wondering how Britain went to be a mighty world empire, this is the answer. It's not because her sailors were tougher and her ships were better than her enemies. It's because they were more methodical and more scientific. Thanks to this scientific approach, the British had achieved something extraordinary. They had brought their entire fleet all the way up the St. Lawrence and right to the walls of Quebec without the loss of a single ship. The French couldn't believe their eyes. They had thought it quite impossible that the British ships would make it this far. The British celebrated, reveling in the achievement of their sailors and navigators. Well, they all did except one man. When Wolfe finally laid eyes on Quebec, he realized the true magnitude of the task that still faced him. Wolfe was so dispirited because he was seeing for the first time the imposing cliffs of Quebec. But you get an even better understanding of what he was up against from the air. possible view up there of the importance of Quebec. No matter how many times you see it on a map, it just nothing compares to being out there and seeing it for yourself. At Quebec, the river narrows down to a, a gap just under a mile wide. And in fact, the Native American word Quebec means the narrows. And that's why this settlement is here, because you can control all the ships going in and out of the St. Lawrence. There's only one way to approach Quebec, and that's from its westward side down there, where it's relatively flat on the plains of Abraham. But all the other sides are surrounded by cliffs, and these acted like a strong fortress wall. Any attacker had to find a way up, and they're very easy to defend. They've got to have the strongest natural defences of any city in North America. As well as its superb position, Quebec also had impressive man-made defences. Oh, 
On the only side of Quebec, not surrounded by cliffs and rivers, the French had built this wall. One other thing Quebec had was plenty of defenders. There was a core group of around two or three thousand professional soldiers. Then a huge number of militiamen turned up, normal Canadians from all over the colony who rallied round to protect the capital city. There were boys as young as 14 and old men. Anyone who could shoulder a musket rushed here to Quebec to fight for their way of life. In charge of this force was Louis-Joseph, Marquis de Montcalm. Given that he was now charged with the defence of Canada, it's ironic that he absolutely hated the place. His letters home to his wife are full of his homesickness for his family and his house in the south of France. He's constantly inquiring after the health of his beloved daughters. He only took the job to ensure his family fortune and a sense of duty as a French nobleman. Montcalm had hoped that the treacherous waters of the St. Lawrence River would stop the British expedition before it ever arrived here at Quebec. But like all good generals, he'd prepared for the worst. For a month before the British were sighted off Quebec, this area had rung with shovels and pickaxes as thousands of people augmented the defences here, placing new cannons, building barricades and trenches. This is one of the most important features of the French defence the Royal Battery. Here there were cannon facing out towards the St. Lawrence, able to fire at any ships that attempted to sail through the Narrows. This was a key part of the French plan, preventing the British from reaching the upper part of the river. So instead, Wolfe's plan had been to attack this flat area east of Quebec, the Beauport shore. But Montcalm had thought of that as well, and he stationed over 10,000 soldiers on this coast. Wolfe knew that it would be madness to try and force his way onto the well-defended shores of the St. Lawrence near Quebec. So the closest he could get where there were no French troops was here, on the east side of the magnificent Montmorency waterfalls. They're one of the natural wonders of this region. And now the British army on this side looks across at the French defenders on the other. And what's so exciting about being in this exact point is one of the famous paintings made of the Quebec campaign by Wolfe's assistant, his aide de camp, called Harvey Smith. And he paints this picture here. And it really is very resonant today. Very little has changed. You see the falls here, steeply wooded slopes stretching off down there. And then obviously the St. Lawrence River there with its British ships. And in the distance, you can see Quebec. The British had made it onto French soil, but they were still miles from Quebec with the waterfall and a powerful French force in the way. So they made this spot just above the waterfall their camp. In a matter of days, they had to create a secure base for thousands of men deep in hostile territory. Wolfe turned this camp on the edge of the Montmorency River into a fortress. He built no less than 11 of these redoubts. It would have been entrenched like this. On top of here, there would have been a stockade of logs with loopholes cut so you could shoot muskets through them, all designed to withstand enemy attack. Behind these redoubts and strong points is where the men slept in neat rows of tents. The tents of the British Army were always laid out on the same pattern, no matter where they were, from Salisbury Plain to the wilds of Canada, to try and give the men a sense of familiarity, a sense of a home from a home. Another key part of the new British approach was an obsession with training. Every day, the soldiers would have spent hours being drilled in musket firing. My platoon, load. The aim of the drill was to turn ordinary men into efficient fighting machines. To find out just what it involves, I joined a group of 18th century reenactors. We'll start off first with some basic postures. So, eyes front. If the officer says, order your fire lock. Order your fire lock, okay. You'll have your fire lock on this side. Your hand will be there. Now, the next one is rest. Now, if you bring this hand... Being a British soldier meant learning a sequence of positions, which you had to be able to copy down to every detail. 
Next posture. Mm. Your elbow square. It's harder than it sounds. Shoulder your fire lock. Yeah. And... Yeah, you've managed to reverse your fire lock. It's a novel uh, interpretation of the drill. The right? full musket okay. drill had more than 20 of these positions. I was doing a simplified version with just four. No, I, don't, I don't feel like a well-oiled military machine here. Right, recover. OK. Uh, recover, which <laughs> one's recover? <laughs> OK, uh, that one's rest. Yes. So which one's recover? We've only done three things so far. I know. Two out of three is bad. <laughs> So, what's that one? That's order. That's order. That's shoulder. Yep. And that's rest. Yep. So which is which is recover? It's the other one. I can't remember the other one. Right. You're going. You're... By learning a series of exact positions, all the soldiers in a group will be synchronised and able to maintain a rapid rate of fire even in the heat of battle. I'm okay. Yeah, well, yeah. that's the theory. Shoulder your fire locks. Recover your fire locks. Prime and load. If the men get out of sync, a soldier could easily end up shooting the person in front. So a unit has to wait for its slowest member. Unfortunately, that was me. Never mind. Is that all right? Break ready! Present! Fire! Welcome to the History Hit YouTube channel, which we are relaunching. We've got all the best exclusive content going straight onto this History Hit YouTube channel. And you can find out, for example, why on earth I'm standing at the top of this mast. You should probably subscribe.